good morning. Welcome everyone to the Return em Right workshop focused on working with anglers to reduce discard mortality. My name is Julia Goss and I'm a project manager at Return em Right and I also work for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or NOAA and I'm based in our headquarters in uh, Silver Spring in the US. So we really appreciate you all coming here today and spending your time at the conference with us. We're eager to share the insights we've learned through Return em Right over the last couple of years, but we really want to learn from everyone in the audience today. So we're looking forward to receiving your input and for this to be a collaborative workshop and an opportunity for us to learn from you all about what you're seeing and hearing and experiencing within your respective fisheries when it comes to reducing discard mortality. We know this is a global issue and one that is extremely important to address. Also, if you've had your, your share of talking about barotrauma and discard mortality, we're also gonna do some giveaways and we're gonna test out everyone's fish ID knowledge. So hopefully that's a little extra incentive to stick around for the next hour and a half. Um, all right, so I'm gonna provide a quick overview of Return em Right. I'm gonna introduce my colleagues who are here with me today and then we'll provide an outline of what we're gonna cover. So Return em Right's goal is to increase survival of reef fish in the Gulf of Mexico by equipping anglers with the knowledge and gear to confidently and successfully release reef fish. This program is part of the efforts to restore the Gulf of Mexico after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010, and it's managed by a coalition of partners, uh, including NOAA, where I work, and my colleagues Sean, Ken, and Jamie work, and then Florida Sea Grant, where my colleague Nick works. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to each of them and let them say hi and introduce themselves. Thanks, Julia. Um, as Julia said, I'm, I'm Jamie Reinhardt. I work for the NOAA Restoration Center. My primary responsibility at NOAA is to help design, develop, and, and implement restoration projects that help restore uh, natural resources that have been injured from oil spills and other Hi guys, my name is Nick Haddad. I'm the lone non-NOAA person here from the team. Uh, I'm the Sustainable Fisheries Communications Manager for the project, and my primary responsibility is to manage the education outreach communications, make sure that the project maintains its fishy feel and the anglers connect with it. I'm a rabid fisherman myself, so that's my primary responsibility for this job. And passing it on to Ken. Hello, I'm Ken Brennan. I'm with the Southeast Fisheries Science Center, uh, NOAA Fisheries. My role within this project is to uh, monitor the prevalence and the effectiveness of these devices through uh, collecting data on log books and, and other data collection efforts. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Sean Meehan. I'm the Recreational Fishing Coordinator for Southeast United States. So I cover Gulf of Mexico, South Atlantic, and the U.S. Caribbean, and Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. With Return on Right, I'm kind of the liaison, if you will, between NOAA Fisheries and this group, making sure, like Nick, we can speak to fishermen in fishermen's language, make sure we're not talking jargony and all that government stuff that often get connected up. So uh, thanks for having us here and look forward to this session. All right, thanks everyone. All right, so we're gonna quickly go through an outline of what we're gonna cover in the next hour and a half or so. So we hope that everyone walks away from this workshop with a bit of a better understanding about some of the tactics, strategies, and messaging that you could use to engage angling communities to reduce discard mortality. We're also going to collaboratively identify challenges and solutions to reducing discard mortality. So in order to do that, Nick's gonna provide a presentation on barotrauma and discard mortality. We're gonna share some insights about what we've learned through managing return em right, some of the challenges and lessons learned um, we've we've developed, then we'll move into the interactive portion of the workshop. And uh, we know there are a myriad of challenges when it comes to reducing discard mortality. So we really wanna hear from you all what you think those top challenges are. We're then gonna break out into breakout groups and we'll have some discussion and we'll nominate uh, one person from each of those breakout groups to then come back and share the highlights and the ideas that you all generated. And then we'll finish with a quick wrap up. So before we dive into the presentations, we'd love to get to know who all is in the audience. Um, and we also wanna receive input from you all throughout the workshop. So in order to do that as seamlessly as possible, we are going to use a very simple tool called Mentimeter. And in order to make sure everyone's comfortable with it, we're gonna do hopefully a quick and painless icebreaker. Um, and so all you need in order to use Mentimeter is your smartphone. So you can go ahead and scan the QR code, or you can type in to any browser, Chrome, Safari, 
um, menti.com and you should be prompted to enter this numerical code. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to Mentimeter. You'll still be able to see the code. Um, let's get this working. All right, so I'll give folks a minute or two to type in menti.com into your browser. Go ahead and type in that numerical code. If anyone's having issues, we know the internet is a little slow, so just feel free to raise your hand and we're happy to come around uh, and troubleshoot. And so we would love to hear if you guys get that prompt on your screen, hopefully. All right, I see one answer so far. We'd love to hear where you're from and um, what fishery you work or primarily recreate in. We know a lot of you work in multiple fisheries, so you could perhaps just share the fishery that is most relevant to your attendance at this conference or your favorite fishery to fish in. So, all right, seeing a couple responses. Again, please just raise your hand if there's any issues with Mentimeter, it doesn't seem to be working for you. All right, great. One's coming from Britain that says you don't seem to have any given input. <laughs> All right, seeing some more come in. So we have USA Longline Reef Fish Shrimp Trawl. We have some Australian Victoria Freshwater folks. All right, Northern Territory, all fisheries, US West Coast, Striped Bass, East Coast. Let's see. Women in Wreck Fishing, Fish Veterinarian, that's great, Northern Territory, Australia Wreck and Charter Fishing. Let's see, we can scroll through these. Yeah, we got folks from a lot of different places. I'm really glad we have some folks from Australia. You guys are gonna be helpful with our next icebreaker question. Um, all right, NC for Higher Fisheries, Southeast US. Hopefully all the folks from the Gulf can ask us the hard questions later on in the workshop. <laughs> Right, rockfish, so um, really good fishery to talk about descending devices and barotrauma, flats fisheries, Ozfish Unlimited, Sydney. Had a layover in Sydney, the airport was really nice. <laughs> yeah, missed a flight in Sydney, had, yeah, it was a mixed bag. <laughs> Victoria fly fishing, freshwater and saltwater. All right, this is great. So we have folks from all over. Has everyone been able to enter, enter their information? All right, Norway. Awesome. Let's see if we have some more pop up. Yeah, all right. All right, so our second and last icebreaker question, we may or may not be crowdsourcing uh, options for what our team is gonna do in our free time in Melbourne, but um, <laughs> this could be as simple as, you know, eating and drinking with your colleagues or a fishing spot that's your favorite you wanna check out, wildlife you wanna see, or if you're from Australia, from the region, just your favorite things to do in, in Melbourne. All right, Great Ocean Road, I know a couple of uh, us are planning to do that after the conference and it looks beautiful. Greek bakery, we'll have to get the name, the name of the Greek bakery maybe. Uh, yeah, the coffee is really good here. I'm a big coffee fan, so that's been really nice. <laughs> I, I think we can do better than that. <laughs> I think, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, we'll be able to survive. Honestly, that's way better than half and half. So. <laughs> All right, uh, coffee, food, beer, meet participants. Yeah, network, um, explore the town, boating along the Yara. I saw a bunch of boats the other day, and I think it'd be awesome to get to go out there. Um, electric bikes around, enjoying the big city vibe. All right, fish. All right. Well, thank you everyone for indulging um, our icebreaker and for giving us some, some ideas for what we should be doing. Um, and Wilson's Promontory, yeah, thank you so much for the hike recommendation. I'm totally gonna do that. So, all right, so that is it for our icebreaker. And I'm gonna go ahead. close out of those browsers because we'll use that. You can just close the screen, but it should be the same link later. We'll use the Mentimeter again throughout this. Yeah, thanks, Nick. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Nick and he's gonna provide a presentation on barotrauma and discard mortality. All right, awesome. So show of hands, uh, who has a thorough understanding of barotrauma already? Half a hand up. About half and half? <laughs> All right, so we'll go over a little bit of everything. So barotrauma, discard mortality, 
Uh, when I'm talking about discards for reef fish uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, I'm talking about a complex of species that are federally managed uh, in the Gulf of Mexico by the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. There's 31 of these species that predominantly include your snapper, your grouper, your amberjacks, and some of those deeper water species. Uh, most of the species are uh, discarded for voluntary and regulatory reasons, and in this fishery, it's primary regulatory reasons. So they're either the bag limit has been met, the species is too small to keep, or it's out of season. Um, and just an example here to show the magnitude of discards in this fishery, in 2016, there were almost 4 million red snapper discarded, um, and almost 83% of those occurred from the private recreational angling community about 13.4% for charter for hire, and about 4% commercial. So why, why these vast differences? Simply the number of anglers. So it's estimated there's around 2 million recre private recreational fishery, or anglers in this fishery uh, that fish for these species. Uh, for charter, there's around 2,000 boats in both state and federal charter boats. And commercial, you're looking at less than 800 boats. So the, the difference in the percentages are primarily the difference in the number of anglers. Uh, there's a high mortality rate due to capture depth, so most of these fish are caught in at least 10 meters up to 20, 30, 40, 50 meters of depth or deeper. Um, and re reducing discard mortality results in a significant increase in the survival of fish, even if we reduce it just by a small percentage due to the simple magnitude of the issue. So anyone go offshore before, release a fish and see it float off? Not a pretty sight, but unfortunately it's still a pretty common sight in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and why does this happen? Because of barotrauma. So barotrauma is a pressure-related injury that fish experience when being reeled up from depth. So the gases expand in the body of the fish, displacing organs and leaving them floated and unable to return down to on their own. In, in the angler's terms in the Gulf, they typically call them floaters. So the barotrauma term isn't always recognizable still. These effects are typically seen in depths of 50 to 60 feet, 15 to 18 meters or deeper. However, it does occur shallower in some species. We heard about walleye yesterday and barotrauma in 10 meters of depth. We, uh, we uh, also see in the United States hogfish typically experience uh, barotrauma more significantly at shallower depths. So why does this happen? Uh, if everyone goes back to their physics classes from many years ago, there's two main laws, Boyle's law, P1V1 equals P2V2. So pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So as you pull a fish up from depth where the pressure is great, pressure is decreasing, which means the volume is increasing in their body proportionately. Uh, we also heard about how barotrauma can get worse at the surface from retention. So that's from the ideal gas law. Pressure and volume are also related to temperature. So if you've ever left a water bottle in your car on a hot day, and you come back in and it's all steamy and expanded, that's from the volume increasing to offset the temperature at a given pressure. So as I, I hear from anglers a lot, oh, that fish will likely swim down like they see it floating off. It's kind of an excuse to themselves, like, uh, don't worry about it, it'll swim down on its own. No, that fish, barotrauma is getting worse at the surface, especially when you pull them up from a cold depth, and they're, in, in Florida, at least the fishery for these species is typically in the summer when it's really hot. So it's getting worse, and the chances of survival are uh, getting less and less as that fish is floating off. So what can we do? Uh, knowing the signs as an angler is the first step. And sometimes external signs of barotrauma aren't always evident. So simply a bloated stomach, if you feel the body cavity of a fish and you feel sperm like a balloon, that's enough for that fish to need additional help getting down or to cause it to float off. So the protruding stomach coming out of the mouth is probably the most commonly known symptom by anglers. Um, that's when the swim bladder expands and actually everts the stomach out of the mouth of the fish. Uh, protruding intestines, uh, bubbling scales, this is probably the lesser known symptom from anglers. And this occurs in deeper depths, so when the air expands so much, it actually forces its way through the skin and out under the scales of the fish. So you can actually see bubbles coming out, or they simply look distorted and lifted off the body. Um, another one, bulging eyes, and I, I mentioned we'll have a couple giveaways here. Uh, we'll, we'll have a couple from our region in the Gulf, and we'll have a couple from Australia. Does anyone know what the common name of this species is? This one right here. And we can go back, and we'll, we're starting to talk. Like my no, nope. it's, it's, it's from the South Atlantic or Gulf. It's, not it's got some white spots, a little yellow portion on the dorsal. What does it call it? A grouper. Grouper. <laughs> Get that guy a hat. Yep. It's a yellow edged grouper. <laughs> You're a Close enough. <laughs> we got some easier ones. We started hard. I was going to ask the scientific name, but I won't go there. <laughs> 
All right, so what are the solutions to uh, barotrauma? Venting is one solution and descending devices are another. Venting is the most commonly known solution in our area, which involves using a hollow hypodermic needle to release the gas from the body cavity, allowing that fish to overcome that positive buoyancy and swim down on its own. Um, descending devices have been around for a couple decades, but they're lesser known to a lot of anglers still, and they come in a, d a couple different varieties. Um, so there's inverted hook style devices, which in, when used in combination with a heavy weight, carry the fish back down to depth, allowing those gases to reach. So I, I like to put this in here because in a lot of other fisheries, we stress the importance of reducing handling, minimizing air exposure. These are just as important while doing these other techniques. So for this, these deep water fisheries, you have to do additional steps, but you have to remember these, these in the process as well. Um, so it's, I, I can't stress enough for especially reducing handling and minimizing air exposure. When you're venting, if you take too long on the surface, to get that air out and you're messing around and then you throw the fish back in, it's likely to float off still. Preventing hook injury, we promote using non-stainless steel, non-offset circle hooks uh, to prevent gut hooking or if you do gut hooking, cutting them line so that it can rust out with the non-stainless steel hooks. Avoiding predators, this is gonna be, uh, continue to be an issue. Uh, the sharks and dolphins, this is something we're gonna face for a long time. For now, we try to tell anglers to move or rotate spots uh, there are reports dolphins will follow you for miles while you're <laughs> offshore fishing to eat your fish after you release them. So this is going to be a problem that we will all continue to face and will probably face more and more as we, as we progress in these fisheries. But uh, for now, we, we try to promote rotating spots, moving, at least if you're losing fish on the way up to sharks. All right, back to Mentimeter. But first, does anyone know the common name of this species? All right, oh. All right, that was too easy. Scientific name. Russell. Russell. All right. Oh. Which one do you want? Uh, the largest one. This one? Yes. There you go. All right, we'll, we'll get you guys with another. All right, then back to Metameter here. We want to share some of the uh, solutions that you've seen in your fisheries to either barotrauma or reducing discard mortality. Um, Sasha mentioned some funny ones <laughs> yesterday about pouring coke over the gills and stuff. We've heard lots of unique solutions that anglers have said to reducing barotrauma. So we want to hear uh, what uh, what y'all have heard in your regions when it comes to lowering discard mortality. You have, right? to, you have to change the method. Oh, here. sorry about that. Yeah, it's still asking that. Yep. Melbourne, I'm behind. Sorry. <laughs> you encountered to reduce discard mortality. Venting spike, wet towel, wet hands, reduce time, environment nets, those are all good things. Just leave them in the water. Leave them in the water. So if, yeah, keeping them wet. Throwing fish on its stomach. <laughs> Stop fishing. So reducing discards is a great way to reduce discard mortality prevent culling. Uh, the less discards we have, we don't have to take the chance of them dying if your bag limit has been met. Filet knife, it's 
So we hear about that a lot as a venting technique. Unfortunately, with a fillet knife, it's not hollow. So if you put a fillet knife in a fish and you twist, you kind of have to twist to allow the gas to escape. So you're creating a bigger wound than you would need to with a proper hollow device. Release weights, keep wet, spearing fish into the water. So uh, is that, I'm guessing that's with tunas and jacks where you throw them. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Throw them in head first and try to give them a little bit of momentum to get down to the bottom. So these are all different techniques. Some of them might be best practices, some of them might not. Uh, anglers have learned from each other over the years through fish tales of different techniques that have worked. I'm gonna share a couple that I've heard through this project. If a fish is bloated, you throw it as high as you can up in the air and it slams on the surface and then it's able to swim down. This I've heard multiple times. You'd think that this is something that wouldn't be a, a best practice to anglers, but I don't know if the swim bladder ruptures and they can swim down or what happens, but anglers have said this. We have Goliath grouper in our area. They get up to five, six hundred pounds and they exhibit barrel trauma. Uh, and anglers like to nudge them with the bow of their boat to get them back down to the bottom. So that's another best practice that anglers have told us. So it's really important for us as scientists, resource managers, communicators, to try to overcome some of these misconceptions and also uh, uh, do our best to educate people on some, why some of these issues are the best practice and why some might not be. All right, back to slides. So now you know kind of uh, a little use it. So we started this project with a baseline survey, a human dimensions baseline survey on recreational reef fish angler attitudes, perceptions, and use of best fishing practices in the Gulf of Mexico. So this survey ran uh, October to December of 2021, and we had over 4,200 responses. So some of the results were interesting. Over 90% of anglers recognized at least one symptom of barotrauma. So that was primarily, or most commonly, the stomach coming out of the mouth. Although they recognized it, a lot of them thought that it was the swim bladder or the fish's tongue, which is both incorrect. Um, but when you came down to the lesser known symptoms like bubbling scales, only 7% of anglers recognized that as a symptom of barotrauma. 71% of private wreck anglers were aware of venting, and almost 11 to 15% used the tool that wasn't hollow. So they had to either twist with a knife or use the ice pick with like a spike that didn't or could cause additional harm or would cause more harm than a venting tool would. But then you see only 32% of private recreationals were aware of the sensor. So these devices have been around for a couple decades now, and less than a third of anglers that experience this barrel trauma on almost every time they fish if they're going offshore fishing for snapper or grouper are even aware of this option as a mitigation. So you can't use this option if you don't know it exists. So we have a huge awareness gap here for us to overcome through this project. And even then, roughly half of them didn't use them, which means they likely didn't know how to, or they just basically heard of them but never used one before. So Return Rights is a seven year project that was funded from Deepwater Horizon oil spill money and has three main components, an education and outreach component, fish descending device distribution, and research and monitoring, which is basically funding studies to improve release mortality estimates and also monitoring the use of the devices in the fishery uh, with the two, three main goals, to reduce mortality in reef fish resulting from barrel trauma and release, improve anglers experiences with the gear. If they have a positive experience with the release gear, they're more likely to use it. And then both of those two things should improve the overall health of our reef fisheries. Um, the plan was to build an independent brand that resonated with anglers. So we have a bunch of different partners working on this project, but instead of having a bunch of different logos, people being confused as to who to go to for the info information, we wanted to create an independent brand that was guided by anglers, but grounded in science, and that promoted all best for these practices. So we're not telling anglers to descend every fish. We're not telling them to vent every fish. We're providing them the education and the tools to do what works best for them in their given situation. Um, education is also a prerequisite for the gear. So we're not just gonna hand out gear willy-nilly and expect people to actually know how to use it and when to use it. They're required to go through an educational component before we distribute the gear. And the Descend Act went in place, which is an interesting kind of hiccup in our project. It was not related to our project at all. But now venting tools or descending devices are required when fishing for reef fish in federal waters of the Gulf of Mexico. So that's great, but a venting tool used improperly or a descending device getting rusty in a cup holder just because it makes you compliant does not help the resource at all. So the education is really what helps the resource the most. 
Um, and our plan was to phase out distribution of the gear and roll the program out by sector, starting with federal for hire reef fish permit owners, captains, and crew, partly because the charter captains are the educators of the sport. It's hard to pick up a rod at your local shop and buy a boat and go offshore in 50 meters and know what you're doing. Most people go on charters first. Um, and selfishly, it's a smaller group that we could work with, so it was almost like us pilot testing the program. This is a group of around 1,200 captains versus over 2 million private recreational anglers. So it gave us a chance to kind of test out the logistics behind our distribution process, our education module, and work with a smaller group first. So the education on best release practices, uh, we wanted to keep it relatively brief. Uh, it's about 15 minutes long, focused on the importance of reducing discard mortality, recognizing barotrauma, and how to use these best release practices. And then upon completion of the course, eligible anglers, which means anglers that fish offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, will receive a package of gear to their doorstep. They just put in their shipping address and we mail them the gear. Um, and I actually made a little abbreviated course just for y'all to view. So if you want to scan this, you're welcome to check it out here briefly. Um, it's, it's made with Articulate Rise software. So um, you can kind of just show, it's just a couple slides of an example of how we have some interactive components where anglers can click on the different spots on the fish and view the signs of barotrauma. There's some videos that are required. There's some videos that are not required. So we, we want to make sure anglers have enough information for what they want to know, but they don't need to watch too, too much. We don't want to overwhelm them with education. And here's the example of the, the package that, yeah, you know, that is the box of gear that will show up on their doorstep. Then. So you can go through that at any time later. It should be available for a while. Um, and I just put that together briefly for, for this workshop. So some education module stats. So we launched May 3rd of last year to the private angling uh, fishery in the Gulf of Mexico. Since then, actually we hit 12,000 last night, completions of our edu education module by eligible anglers. So that means anglers that fish offshore in the Gulf, even more people went through it that were not eligible for gear that simply were from other areas or didn't, didn't fish offshore but were interested in best practices. Here's the sector breakdown. So we've had over 11,500 private recreational anglers complete the program. The average completion time is 14 minutes, so pretty close to our goal for 15 minutes. Um, and you can see the distribution across the Gulf of Mexico, pretty heavy on both coasts of Florida. And these folks travel down to the Gulf, so you'll see people from all over the US in certain areas um, that, that basically travel down. It's a pretty big destination fishery as well. What's been really cool is at the end we had stick, we have a follow-up survey that is optional, um, and over 6,300 people completed it. So I feel like it's hard to get people to do anything voluntarily, when it, especially additionally that they didn't need to do. But what's really cool is out of those 6,300, we had over a thousand people actually take the time to type in free responses as to why they were interested, and so many great comments on conservation. Anglers want to be the best stewards of the resource; they just need additional help. So many comments thanking us that saying, hey, I didn't know I was planting wrong my whole life. <laughs> I feel bad, I've been stabbing the stomach coming out of my mouth for years, or out of the fish's mouth for years. So anglers really want to do the right thing. Sometimes they just need additional education and help. Um, and just a little public response here. This is stuff I found online. That, uh, so this was Tampa Offshore Fishing Group. Someone posted their link to our training and said this is the best idea I've seen in 50 years of Florida fishing. This is the whole truth. This is a boating forum. Someone said, Don, thanks, Rick. That pain that was painless and the training was actually informative. Anyone someone anytime someone calls a, a training painless is a win in my book, so I was pretty stoked to see that. Uh, thanks, knocked it out. Good training. Uh, I thought the training was well done. Might stop people from venting fish by stabbing them in the stomach coming out of the mouth. I find this amazing timing as just today we had to use a little peer pressure on the boat that didn't make any attempt to release the best method correctly. Um, and we have, this is another forum, Pensacola Fishing Forum. What's nice is they have it rigged with a free three pound weight. So we have it pre-rigged, something that's not commercially available typically, to try to make it easier on folks uh, using the gear. And then lastly, a couple emails to our inbox after snapper fishing with the sending devices the last four days and on the report they worked flawlessly and we did not have one floater. One final suggestion, every one of the fishing shows should be using a descending device and should be role models in this regard. I can't tell you how important this is. So it's been cool to see people just kind of finding stuff online by typing in return of right and seeing what the public's saying about, uh, about our program without them sending it to us directly. And we actually just, this is very preliminary results, 
but we just launched a follow-up survey to anglers who have had gear we sent them for six months to see what, whether they use the gear, what their preference were for venting and descending. And you'll actually see there's been a shift for this is people that have never, uh, have always descended. So before the program, almost no one descended. Now always jumps up significantly to over 20%. And in the next six months, they plan to. So the preference has actually shifted from venting to descending from before and after our program, which is, I mean, venting works as well, but I think for the majority of private recreational anglers who might not be as confident putting a needle in a fish on a rocking boat or have the precision that you might see in some of these studies by scientists, uh, the simply clipping a fish on the device and dropping them down is, I think, easier for the majority of folks, especially since a lot of people think this is a boga grip. So <laughs> that also, we get that comment a lot too. But that's been cool to see. And, and uh, for now, uh, for strategies for initial project success, I'm gonna pass it back to Julia, who can kind of talk about how we reached many of our anglers. Yeah, thanks Nick. So I'm gonna go through some strategies I've allowed for initial project success. And then I'm gonna touch on the challenges we've encountered and the lessons that we've learned. So Nick mentioned, um, you know, rather than having any of the three core program partners be the face and the voice of this program, we decided to independently brand it Return Em Right. And we think, um, you know, this has allowed for us to create a unique and authentic brand that anglers can identify with. And it's also allowed us to have all of this information on best release practices going to our target audience from one central platform, one central voice, which we think has reduced you know, some of the confusion when people are looking for guidance on best release practices. So we know anglers receive their information from a variety of sources. So in order to raise awareness regarding Return Em Right, we've also utilized a variety of outreach methods, uh, including podcasts, radio shows, social media, advertising, garnering earned media, and seeking out editorial opportunities. Publications are always looking for content, and so those can be a great way to really tell your story. We're also always looking for additional outreach ideas. So uh, if anyone has creative ones, we're, we're always all ears to try, try new things. All right, so we know research shows that social norms have a really strong influence um, when it comes to whether anglers will mitigate barotrauma, invent, or descend. So with that in mind, we've launched an ambassador program. So we're currently working with three recreational anglers who are well-respected within their regions and in their fisheries. And we believe their promotion of best release practices is influencing anglers to do the same. And there's also the twofold benefit that they're helping to promote return em right within their respective fisheries. And so we mentioned that return em right is managed by three core partners, but we've also developed numerous partnerships with other organizations and without which we would not have had this initial success. And I think most of the talks I've been to at this conference so far have really touched on the importance of that collaboration and those partnerships to succeed. So for example, we're working with the state fishery agencies. They're helping to uh, monitor the prevalence of use of descending devices in the fishery. They're also helping us to get the word out regarding Return Em Right. Similarly, our media partners are helping to raise awareness regarding this new brand and opportunity. And finally, our industry partners, for example, Sequelizer, and we're also working with other descending device manufacturers to get the gear out to offshore recreational anglers. All right, so science has shown that venting and descending improves reef fish survival, but it can be hard to just take that at its word without actually seeing fish swim off and fish being recompressed. So this is relatively simple, but we focused on creating videos that show fish recompressing and swimming off and surviving. And we think these have been particularly impactful. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, play a short video. So this is a compilation of releases um, that were filmed through various trips. Some of these trips were actually filmed. Uh, Return Em Right is funding collaborative research with scientists to better uh, revise the mortality estimates for various reef fish. Um, so you can see here different situations, two fish swimming off, you know, different species. So just trying to show anglers that this really does work um, and you can, you know, kind of see it here. And we actually have some videos of them swimming, you know, out, sharks are in the water and they're kind of swimming past them. Um, so a lot of different situations where uh, fish are surviving. So we're also continuing to refine our messaging 
So the human dimension survey that Nick mentioned also found that the majority of offshore Gulf reef fish anglers want to help fish survive and they understand that using best release practices can help them to do that. So with that in mind, we focused uh, our messaging on the fact that it's anglers' responsibility to conserve the resource and that anglers are also in control of how they release fish. So there's other factors that are outside of anglers' control when it comes to the sustainability of the resource, but they can make a difference when they release fish successfully. We're also working to increase awareness regarding the magnitude of the discard mortality issue. You know, if you go out and you see a handful of fish float off every day, no big deal, but when that's millions of anglers all doing that, it has a really big impact. And then also raising awareness regarding the solutions to discard mortality. So like Nick said, if you don't know descending is an option, you, you can't use that to um, help fish survive. And then with the for hire sector, again, we're continually modifying our approach to this, uh, this group. And we know captains work really hard to identify the spots that they take their clients. So releasing fish is one way to help keep those spots healthy. And captains are also the educators on the water. So they have a tremendous opportunity to teach anglers who might not know how to release fish. Uh, successfully. All right, so lastly, we want to make things as easy as possible. We know adopting new behaviors, whether it's adopting new fishing gear or trying to make a gym routine more regular or adopting a new routine at work, it takes time and effort to change behaviors. So to that end, um, again, we're making things as easy as possible as easy as possible. So we have the gear that we hand out that Nick mentioned is all um, pre-rigged to the weight. So we have you know, the stabilizer with the three-way swivel attached to the weight. And so it all comes like that in the box and you can just take it out and use it um, on the water. And the weight is looped on. So if you're running offshore, you can quickly loop the weight off. So it's not bouncing around on your boat or you can swap weights if you want to use a different weight or if you need to add weight or remove weight based on the size of the fish you're catching, you can quickly do that as well. Yeah, and so our outreach materials too, we provide tips and tricks for descending. And one of the main things we stress is to not get discouraged whenever you're using new gear, it can take time. So just because it didn't work the first time, you know, just keep at it and it'll get a lot easier and it'll become second nature. All right, so we want to touch on the challenges we've encountered too. We think this is important. So with education, um, there's a lot of information about best release practices and we want to be able to provide as much as we can. We also want it to be simple and memorable. So when anglers go out on the water, again, it's second nature. They don't have to think too hard about what they need to do. So finding that balance uh, is always a challenge. We also know interactive materials are more interesting. They're more memorable, more engaging. They're also a lot harder to create and also standardizing them across the many digital platforms we have in this day and age is, is difficult. So reaching our target audience, so we want this program to be inclusive so anyone can take our education module and then it's the folks who um, fish or live in the Gulf of Mexico that can receive the gear. And we really want the gear to go to offshore wreck anglers that are going to use it to increase fish survival. So we have a couple mechanisms in place to make sure we are reaching that target group, but there's no silver bullet to really verify that's who we're, we're getting the gear to. So that's always a challenge. Then there's a number of misconceptions when it comes to descending fish. So a lot of folks think that fish is dead. There's no way we brought it up from that deep that it's going to survive. I might as well not take that extra time to actually descend it. Um, and then also we hear a lot that people think descending devices are just feeding sharks. And um, good thing is there's a lot of researchers who are helping to study this and, and helping us to get a better answer uh, for anglers. In terms of outreach, building a recognizable brand always takes time. We're lucky to have partners who are helping us to do that. And then creating behavioral change is hard. So even if um, you know, people say they have an intention to change a behavior, it doesn't necessarily mean they are going to adopt that behavior. So that's always a challenge. And then finally, monitoring and evaluation. So if you attended Jamie's talk yesterday, he talked about uh, our efforts to monitor the program's impact. So we're really lucky that we're working within existing data collection processes with partners. But of course, with that comes challenges because there's differing priorities uh, amongst those who are collecting the data. And lastly, the Gulf of Mexico is a really large region. So there's regional differences across it. Um, for example, there's depredation hotspots where other areas depredation isn't as much of an issue. So being able to tailor our messaging while still having it be broad enough um, for the whole Gulf is always a challenge. 
All right, and finally, just some core lessons that we've learned. Uh, developing partnerships and building networks is key. Again, I've heard that a lot at this conference so far. And then starting simpler and expanding. So like Nick mentioned, we started with the for hire sector and we actually changed a lot and made a lot of improvements by the time we launched to the private recreational sector. So that really helped us. Identifying the right incentives and messaging. Again, with the for hire sector, we originally thought providing that $100 box of release gear and the messaging that we had was going to generate the level of participation and buy-in we were looking for, and we didn't really hit the mark. And so we've continued to revise that and how we're approaching that really important stakeholder group to, to get their participation. And then finally, building a brand fishermen identify with. Um, so I mentioned this uh, at the start, but this has been really foundational uh, for the projects success. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie and we're going to move into the interactive portion of our workshop. Well, yeah, now now's the time to get back on onto the Mentimeter and everybody gets a chance to stretch out, move around a little bit for, for, for this activity. Um, let's see, I probably got to update this for this to work, right? How do I go to the next slide? This one? On the keyboard. Next slide. Okay. So the, the question that we're posing to you uh, now is in. Go back to the QR code. Oh, go back to the QR code? All right. Thanks. All right. Give everybody. Oh, no, and that's not it. QR code is on this slide. There we go. So, gosh. How do I display on, on the right slides? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you can scan it. Okay, good. Everybody, everybody, get back to the Mentimeter. Everybody there yet? We're good. All right. All right. Super. So here's the question: um, With the respective recreational fisheries that you work in, or that you are most familiar with, or you have most connection to, what are the largest challenges that you currently face um, in reducing? Uh, discord mortality so um, thanks for that size limit so that's a, like a regulatory issue adoption of best practices perceptions about um, depredation and other environmental biological factors educating anglers awareness Size and bag limits again, another sort of uh, regulatory issue. The culture change is an interesting one, too. If you look at tarpon and bonefish and some of these species that are more considered sport fish, uh, even largemouth bass, uh, the culture has changed significantly over the last couple of decades where it used to be a catch and kill. Mm. Now it's almost sh shamed upon if you keep those species. But in, the, you know, in some of these more meat eating or consumptive based fisheries, that culture isn't really there yet to like take care of that fish. You might have a someone who will barely lift the bonefish out of the water and then go offshore and have no idea how to properly release the fish that they pull up in the deep. And it's not intentional. It's usually just the culture's not there and the lack of education. Angler inconvenience. More predators. Education. All right, well, so um, what what I'm going to ask folks to do at this point first, I, I kind of want to ask people to help identify maybe three different themes that we're seeing out of the responses here. So I'll kind of scroll back and forth on these, and then what we're going to do is we're going to break out into three different uh, groups. We can do three or four, so yeah. So if we have, yeah three or four different groups. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to sort of self-identify which group they want to uh, participate in for, for, for various topic. And uh, then we're going to use those groups to have a, a discussion, um, a semi-guided, facilitated discussion. We have a couple questions that might help lead um, that discussion. And then we'll have a one person from each group do a little report out on maybe the, the top three top three things that were discussed within that group um, when we come back as a group. So um, I'm, I think one theme that I'm seeing here is the education theme. Um, so 
you know, here's an education, uh, educating anglers with respect to cultural change, education and culture. Um, so we see education and culture as two separate things or as the same thing? That's different? Yeah, I see them as kind of separate things. Yeah. But they can be so interrelated. Okay, so can we make that, well, can we make, edu I guess, education? Let's do, let's do at least lack of education as one challenge to start, or education. Or, yeah, well, yeah, lack of education or education or providing education as a challenge. Any other themes that uh, folks are picking up on here? I think that um, uh, the adoption of the practices, so following the education, the streams, Transfer of knowledge, adoption of practice. Participation. Yeah, so that's kind of like, you know, first you need to be aware of it in the education floor, right. and then actually using it, like yeah. the use, proper adoption and use of it. Well, I think that links to some of the excuses that are mine about why yeah. people learn. So they're aware of it, but I don't use it because sharks are going to eat them yeah. or it's inconvenient or something like that. Okay. So adoption or use. Yeah, yeah adoption. Participation. Do you want to see that? Use? No, we have to get to these products to use as well. Access? Mm -hmm. I saw a couple like tag limit, size limit. Yeah, the regulations. Yeah, trust, mm -hmm. regulations. Yeah, I saw two or three and balance between. So is that, is that a theme that we should uh, discuss? Uh, I, think, I think it's an important thing to consider. Yeah, we can okay. do. Regulation, regulatory or bag, bag limits or regulation. Regulation challenges with yeah, respect regulation. to regulations and that. So, Sean. Sean, Sean do you yeah. want to write I'm making friends. We always have a tough time thinking All right, so we have three different um, stations uh, set out. So what we're going to ask is folks to kind of choose Hopefully, we can have a relatively even distribution of participants in each one of these uh, in each one of these sections. So, if folks either want to move, slide over. We can move some chairs over if that's helpful. Kind of make a circle out of these chairs. There's a group back there and a and a group back with Sean. So, while everybody does that, I'm also going to just switch over to. Um, Um, just to, these are suggested questions for, to help facilitate the, the conversation. Talk what you want to talk about in each one of these groups. If you need help kind of getting started, um, here's are some of our suggestions. So why, why is this uh, challenge important to address? Um, how have, in your own experiences, so um, how have you addressed any of these issues within the, your respective fisheries uh, w with respect to uh, release mortality? It doesn't have to be barotrum either. It could be yeah. freshwater fisheries. Yeah. Uh, what are, what's the messaging that's been used to help overcome this, these challenges? Tactics regarding communications and um, maybe perhaps question about monitoring for effectiveness or monitoring for change within, with that uh, specific issue. Okay, well, I'll hand it over to each group to kind of start kicking off. And if folks want to just identify at the beginning who might be doing the reporting out, that might be helpful. And we're going to give everybody, you know, probably around probably around ten minutes for discussion. Yeah.